welcome back to more Blue Planet, everybody. As always, we have stuff to say before the podcast where we will say more stuff. First, we are super excited to tell you that next week is a new Character Evolution Cast episode with the one and only Jim McClure. We, Jim McClure? Jim McClure! That Jim McClure? Yes, the one you're thinking of. We will be discussing one of Jim's favorite topics, the eight kinds of fun. And oh boy, it is a lot of fun. All eight kinds. <laughs> yes, most definitely. I'm sorry, everyone. And- I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> But we have a reminder that if you are interested in supporting us, one of the best ways to do that is through the One Shot Network Patreon. While we wish that character creation cast could be a full-time job, it isn't. But money from the Patreon does help us and other shows on the network with the cost of equipment and even allows us to go to conventions. Plus, you get access to all kinds of cool rewards. You can find the Patreon at patreon.com slash one-shot podcast. So, as of the time that we were recording this, this morning, they put out an episode in the Secret Archive that is James and Mel playing Starcrossed um, as, like, the backstory to their characters on the, the one-shot arc that they just finished. And I want to listen to it so bad because they're in love in real life and also in the game. And oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. I'm going to listen to it in a little bit. So, yes. Now, now I have to listen. Yeah. Now you need to, like, back the Patreon and then get access to the Secret Archive and listen to people who are in love pretend to be in love. I'm pretty. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Right? What could be better? Exactly. Another really excellent way to support us without spending money is to leave us a rating or review. So it helps people find us, lets them know what we're about, and it also makes us feel warm and fuzzy inside. Very fuzzy. Very fuzzy. Plus, it means we get to read them to you, like this one, which I will read to you now. It is titled Great Fun by Moriathlin from the USA. Amelia and Ryan are right. Character creation really is the best part of an RPG. And they're a delightful duo to lead their guests through creating characters in a variety of different systems. They go step by step through the process, relying on their guests, either game designers or fellow podcasters, to lead the way as experts. Lots of fun. Thank you so much, Maury Ethlin. Thank you. We are glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, and we love hearing reviews like this, and we are very, very low on them right now. So uh, if you want, go ahead to iTunes our Apple Podcasts, and leave a review there, and we will go ahead and read it as soon as we get to it on the air. With all of that out of the way, here is the episode. Yeah, enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a group for Blue Planet. This episode, we are discussing the character creation process. We are very excited to welcome back Rich Howard and Jeff Barber. Hi, guys. Hello. Jeff was unable to join us for a full character creation session last time, but is able to join us for the discussion episode. So, Jeff, could you go ahead and reintroduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the character that uh, you had prepared for us? Yeah, um, name's Jeff Barber. Uh, I'm basically Biohazard Games. 20 years ago now, we put out a game called Blue Planet, and you guys are cool enough to to want to know more about how that works. I'm currently working on a game called Upwind, uh, which is essentially a, a love letter to the Studio Ghibli adventure films, uh, and that uh, was kickstarted last year and due out here in the next few months. Most of the time, I'm a high school teacher. Wonderful. And a little bit about your character. So I picked a uh, Silva hybrid. Her name is Esther Merriweather. Uh, she has been in the past worked with the GEO as a native patrol person on Poseidon. She is a new, what's called a newcomer, though she's been here most of 20 years and a member of the Bright Savannah hybrid reservation. She's, it sounds like we decided that 
she struck out on her own at some point after working directly with the GEO and recruited the rest of you guys to be part of a a rural sort of native focused, native community focused emergency response team, rather than having the GEO have an official presence in the Sierra in the way of a cluster where all the corporate and geo organizations are anathema. She thought that maybe she could do some good by providing some of those same ERT services in uh, that rural environment. Very nice. And Rich, do you want to introduce yourself again and tell us a little bit about your character? Yeah. Um, So my name is Rich Howard. I am a co-creator of a podcast called The the Young Justice Files, Whelmed The Young Justice Files. And I'm also a co-designer with a fantastic team on a Powered by the Apocalypse game called Descent into Midnight. Uh, I do some writing for 5th edition material. I used to do some Pathfinder uh, material writing as well. And uh, that's kind of where I am now. And then the character I created, his name's Tane. He's what's called a uh, an aqua form. So he is a human, and in this case, descended from the original settlers of Poseidon. He is a human who's genetically modified into what they call a diver. Uh, and a diver is, as opposed to a squid, it was the colloquial terms, a diver is someone who's had basically the mammalian dive reflex turned up uh, to 11 in humans. So he can hold his breath for upwards of an hour. He has a lot of what's called myoglobin that stores oxygen in his muscles. Uh, his eyes are modified for being able to be underwater, etc. cetera, uh, as opposed to squids who are actually modified to be able to draw oxygen directly out of the water and swim as well. He is a native, as I mentioned, his parents were part of the first wave of colonists but he grew up in the back alley streets of a place called Haven, which is one of the big um, settlements on Poseidon. So he grew up in a pretty bad, basically a bad part of town. He worked his way out of that by showing his skills as a, um, as a pilot, first as a, as a uh, tourist, basically navigator, and then got into uh, the, the local military and became a, a trained professional pilot for uh, what they call hoppers or jump ships and uh, that kind of thing, and uh, was recruited into this team as the pilot and kind of a a bit of a, a survivalist and pilot uh, recruited in by um, our friendly Silva. And by the way, I don't know if we went through it over the last episode. Silvas are a genetic hybrid of gorillas and humans. So she's pretty bulky and and buff there are a couple of different uh, okay. animal human hybrids yeah a couple of human <laughs> animal hybrids they tried to do a lot of them and and many of them were not viable the only ones that ended up being genetically viable were silvas and cats yeah, yeah there's there's um and and not to make it too anamorphish uh they they've just stolen a few key traits they're not animal they're not human like animals they they are humans with with a few characteristics that right. have been reinforced by some of the the genetics of these species. Yeah, right. Oh, okay, so Amelia, question, which I don't know if we want to edit out later. We can, I guess. Why, why, why those two particular well, hybrids? Like Rich, like Rich said, um, they there was a lot of experimentation um, in the history of the setting to create better humans. Um, mm-hmm. And prior to the advent of Long John, which is sort of the MacGuffin that drives the economy of the setting, uh, genetic engineering was a lot more difficult. It was easier to take sections from animals that already existed and try to incorporate those, much like we're doing in the real world today. And and unfortunately, um, and also as a standard trope of science fiction, one of the first things people tried to do was make better soldiers. And so they wanted them to be stronger. They wanted them to have more endurance. They wanted them to be faster. They wanted them to be able to see in the dark. They want to enhance their reflexes. And so they looked at a lot of the large mammal species that were either really strong or predatory. And um, these were the only two strains that proved viable that actually were um, reproductive so that it could make some modifications and create sort of mule versions of different creatures. And actually there are a few in some of the subsequent supplements that, um, like the Mongol, for example, that actually are still exist, but these were the only two that could breed true. And they're the only ones that therefore have um, still exist generations later. Okay. Um, they were 
essentially in corporate servitude. Uh, and once their existence was revealed, there was a big public outcry. The GEO got involved and essentially the corporations had to give them up. Um, and the GEO has been trying to support them as an institution as much as, as they can. And so that's why a lot of them work for the GEO. And that's why there are a disproportionate number of them on Poseidon because they were offered sort of a homesteading opportunity. And that's where the Bright Savannah Reservation came from. Okay, um, It's probably relevant to note that there aren't very many of them, but because player characters, players are the way they are, they gravitate <laughs> to those types of creatures. So, you know, there, there are a lot more player characters that are hybrids than exist in the population. <laughs> same, with, same with the natives. The natives are outnumbered by the new colonists and, and so forth. But, you know, we know how players are. They like to they like to play the weird stuff. So that's one of the reasons we offer them in the game, but also why they seem to be more prevalent in player character parties. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason in, in creating the game that you picked those two hybrids or was there a scientific reason or were you just oh. like those, those seem like they had the attributes that you wanted or. I think it's a little bit of everything, right? What is ultimately what are players going to think is cool. So you want to mm -hmm. include that stuff in your decisions genetically matching up gorilla traits with human traits would be pretty easy because there's such similarity in their genetic code. Uh, and then of course, games love cat people. It seems yeah. to be a, <laughs> it's ubiquitous across genres. And I think that's sort of was one of the main driving forces for that choice. And just yeah, as I was yeah. reading it, I was like, those don't make sense underwater. <laughs> no, yeah, they weren't meant for Poseidon. They were meant for Earth. Mm -hmm. um, but they're here. They're here now because of history. They're also. Uh, I'll also admit to an homage in those decisions to a book called The Long Run, uh, which is part of a series, I think, by an author named Alexander Key, and he had a number of sort of characters that were animal hybrids, and those were some of the more common was the big cats and and the gorillas. And there was a lot of inspiration for Blue Planet from that series. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think he ever finished the series, or at least I've never been able to find the the, the third and fourth books. But thank you well, for satisfying my curiosity. Right. I just need to know <laughs> why. Awesome. All right, uh, Amelia, why don't you tell us a bit about your character? Sure, I chose to make a a native dolphin character. I want to name her Gertrude. I don't have a last name, though, because I don't know what a good dolphin last name is. Can it well, just be any last name? Within canon, dolphins, or well, cetaceans in general, name themselves at, generally after their occupation or what currently interests them. And, and then as that interest change or occupations change, so do their names. Oh, that's so cool. Um, it's oh. because they don't use the naming like we do. They they So one of the essential features of the cetaceans is their echolocation and the communication that they are able to use between each other with that echolocation. So they, they use what are called sound pictures is sort of the, the unit of word. And so when you can create a whole image with a single sound or, you know, uh, sort of elongated sound, it's a lot more um, specific and productive than using human based phenomes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so her name may be the dolphin equivalent of Gertrude with a last name, but as far as the rest of the team is concerned, she'll have probably been named whatever she feels like is important to her right now. And then in a, in a week you may say, well, now you call me this because this is what's important to me now. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's why Rick, Rich's um, pilot character was named Hotshot because he knew that lots of times pilots are referred to Hotshot. So I must be a Hotshot now. Um, and right. and a, an imperfect understanding of human spoken language is what leads to it. In fact, there's a language called inter, interspecies or, or interspeak where dolphins can use some limited sounds, but also body position and motion to express sort of a, a dolphin sign language so that humans can understand it. And humans then speak because dolphins can understand the spoken word um, and they can hear it just fine. So the human side is is spoken word the dolphin side is this sort of modified sound and sign language cool. that you can learn as a skill Great. oh cool and cetacean um, senses of humor are also a little bit different they're like a little bit off to the side of human uh humor so sometimes the names names are drawn off of their interpretations of humans 
and their humor around humans. So I chose for for professions want to be uh, a dancer and a diplomat um, as acting as sort of a cultural attache for our, our little group. I, I think that. the dancer part is awesome because it fits right into a whole bunch of assets, sorry, aspects of the setting. There's this thing called the church of the wealth song theogony, which is sort of um, without getting into the details of it. It's sort of the, a, a cultural touchstone for most statisticians. It's a, I guess at first blush, it's sort of a new agey religion-y kind of thing, um, but it's also a, a community-based, a community-driven organization that holds the cetaceans together because they lack an old culture, right? Okay. They're, they're fairly recent in terms of their uplifting, so they're, they're striving for something that's going to hold them together as a cultural identity, nice. so that's a big big part of it, but they have a lot of ceremony and a lot of celebration and lot sort of, of underwater movements are a big part of those celebrations and those ceremonies. So there are like official singers and official dancers who are part of the church of the whale song. That sounds perfect for what I need. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Ryan? I created a uh, cat that is named Archibald Covington, the third who goes by Archie. And he is a native born on the planet, which was uh, pretty much one of the first, I guess, native born cats. Uh, yeah. His parents would have been would have emigrated, yes, um, probably with the the GEO homesteading initiative, and then he certainly would have been no more than probably twenty two or three years old. Yeah, yeah. So he's in his early twenties. He studied uh medicine and science with his parents and with the university and learned a lot from the the other people that are native to the planet you know he's very compassionate and uh likes classical music uh he's he's basically the the medic of the team uh so he was kind of uh signed on to this to, to help people in a very dire situation. And he jumped at the opportunity to be able to do good. So from here, we're going to go ahead and dive into our discussion segment, which we call D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts? Ryan, I don't know if you want to go ahead and start us out here. Yeah, sure. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process, uh, specifically to this system as well as other systems. Um, and how it compares to other systems that are out there. And we also like to get to know the the people that we're talking to a little bit. So our, our first question actually comes to both you, Jeff, and Rich. How did you first get into role-playing games? I, one of those classic things, moved to a new town, didn't know anybody, uh, kind of a weird kid, ran into some other weird kids. <laughs> <laughs> that, that new weird kid said, hey, I got this thing called D&D. &D. Why don't you come over after school? And, you know, the rest is history. I was hooked instantly and have been sort of chasing that first experience ever since. <laughs> That's awesome. How about you, Rich? I wasn't a weird kid. <laughs> I was totally a weird kid. Uh, but my brother was a weird kid first. So he um, he was playing with his friends back in the 70s. And uh, he's about eight years older than I am. So my mom would make him take me with him. I was six, seven, eight years old. So I'd it's your mom's fault. Oh, totally. Absolutely. And so I would go and they, I would play this pinball machine they had that was like, they'd rigged it so it was quarterless. And I just play this pinball machine and watch them play D&D for hours. And then eventually they, I'm not sure if they invited me to play. I invited myself <laughs> to play. I'm not sure. So eventually they let me sit down at the table and they tried to give me as innocuous a character as possible. So they gave me a first level elf wizard with, uh, I'm sure, one hit point and a sleep spell. But uh, what ended up happening is they kicked in this door and there was like 16 goblins in the room and I cast my sleep spell and critted the roll. And so all these 16 goblins fell asleep and the whole table cheered for me. And, uh, that just ended it. I was in, I was fully in a bunch of 16 year old boys playing D and D cheering for this eight year old who had just done this heroic thing. Like, yeah, I want that all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's quite the emotional high to, to really like oh, yeah. start it out on. Oh yeah. It was good. 
so yeah that was it so <laughs> can you guys tell us about your personal process for picking a character type or creating a character in any game that you play do you have a usual way that you do it well despite your tagline for for this game that the character creation is the best part of any role-playing game fashion <laughs> <laughs> I hate making characters. <gasps> Rude. I do. Yes. But I don't hate it for the reason that you're probably thinking I hate it. Right? I hate it for the glut of options and for the promise that making characters uh, implies about the campaign. As I begin to make a character, it takes me forever because I'm like, ooh, I want to do that. No, I want to do that. Oh, no, I want to do that. So I get really excited and I start exploring the setting and I try to make a character that I think takes advantage of what that setting has to offer in a way that another setting might not because in playing that game, I want to experience something different. Um, so that's usually where I start. And then in, in the actual uh, process of, of you know, working out the numbers and, and such, that's mostly goes hand in hand with trying to develop the concept for the character. Usually I have a little bit of an idea of who I want the person to be, but I don't know about what your experiences have been. I never really seem to realize who that person is until the first couple of sessions of play. And then it just sort of, that voice starts to appear kind of on its own, which is part of the magic of role playing and part of the frustration of role playing. You know, when you start want to start out being one particular kind of character and you end up being another because that's just where the voice came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of have that problem, but I, I'm usually the person running games. So like Jeff was saying at one point, like he's often running the games. So when I do get to play, I usually recently, I try to draw on what is, what, what do I want personally? Right. And recently, at least over the last few years, it's just been like, you know what? I want to be a player in more aquatic games. <laughs> so, and also I tend to play, I like playing the kind of um, support roles so like, you know, in D&D, I like playing bards. I like playing clerics, right? I like playing the medics and the healers. I'm a nurse. So, you know, I guess that goes. That checks out. I'm cliche. Yeah. <laughs> but I also, uh, I also have a good time at a table when I'm helping other people realize what they want in their, their character and becoming a part of their story. And then hopefully that reciprocation will happen and they'll become a part of my story. That's such an and extrovert thing to say. <laughs> it is an extrovert. Yeah, it is. That's who I am. So uh, it is, and it makes me excited. But that's why I like to run games as well. Like I, running a game isn't a chore. I love running games. I wish I had more time to devote to running the games because my goal is I, that that makes me excited. It, it's a mm -hmm. workout for my brain, but it also I want to. What do you? I, it basically gives me insight into the psychology of all my friends. Right. You know, like, why are you playing this character that seems completely different than what I see you as? You know, like, are you doing it to be different or are you doing it because the way you perceive yourself is different than I perceive you? Right. Uh, which I think is interesting. I am also really, I, I tend to play things like the nature focused characters. So a native pilot with some survival skill appeals to me, like a scientist or something that it's exploratory for Blue Planet would, would interest me. I could do that as well. Mostly, I tend to walk into games and say, what is everybody else playing? What do you need? What do we need to round out this story? Depending on the system, you know, then, then I will play that because I can adapt what I want to play to pretty almost anything. Yeah. So how do we think character creation in this game in Blue Planet stacks up to other systems that we've played? Well, I'll start with this one. So one of the things that's always fascinated me about the Blue Planet generation system is the fact that at least it, particularly in the time that it came out, like Jeff was saying, a lot of games were like, well, what do you what do you do? Right. And there were a few games that asked the question instead, who are you? Yeah. And Blue Planet is a game that asks, who who were you? Who are you? How did you get to where the game starts? And not a lot of games do that. Like you have to do a lot of work to like, mm -hmm. oh, I wrote a I wrote a backstory for my character. Oh wow, that's great. Thanks for writing a backstory. Well, the development of characters in Blue Planet is your backstory, right? So you're picking an origin, meaning there's a place that you came from. Yeah. Right. So if you and, and then you're picking backgrounds, which is this interesting twist, right? You're like, well, wait, but isn't origin and background the same? No. For my character Tane, his origin is native. 
his whole lineage was born on this planet for the last few generations, right? He, he, his parents were there when the whole thing started. That's his origin. But his background is he grew up in the streets. So even though he has this genetic and cultural origin with his family, he grew up in a bad part of the streets because that's what the world is like right now. Yeah. And then profession stacks on top of that and that, okay, well, that's where I, that's where my family came from. And this is what my childhood was like, but what did I do to change that childhood? Or what did I do to play off of that childhood? Or did I embrace that childhood? And so by the time you even start this game, I have this vision in my head of where this kid came from or where this man came from. Cause he's probably in his late twenties. And, and can envision some of the experiences he had if he, if he was a native and then lived on the streets and then worked his way out of that and joined the military to become a pilot, at least even if it's the native, even if it's the native militia military to become a pilot, I have a really solid vision Yeah. as opposed to, you know, say like um, my cleric of Poseidon character I played in a campaign for a while. I knew what he did. Yeah. But I had to really like, okay, now they have backgrounds in fifth edition, so I can be like, okay, he was a noble, but how There's is he There's still different? only like one sentence backgrounds. Yeah. Right. They're little backgrounds. They add a little bit. They're much better than they used to be. I think it's great. I like it. But if I, if I make three characters who are nobles, my brain is going to make them very similar unless yeah. I really work to make them different. And here, all, all four of us are technically playing basically natives. Mm-hmm. But all of us are very different exactly. right, from our backgrounds and our history and our family because of the way that this system uh, layers on itself. And then the other thing is when you pick these professions and backgrounds, it's not just it's not just the 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 narrative, you know, written word, which is really interesting when you're reading these backgrounds and professions. But also it gives you a whole bank of skills. And in other games, you don't get to do that. So, you know, you're the medic, Ryan. Yeah. But also Jeff's character is an EMT. And just as a part of the backgrounds that I picked, I also have a little bit of knowledge of first aid. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're in another system, like you're either the cleric or you're not <laughs> like you're the yeah. healer. And if you're the healer, <laughs> no one else needs to be the healer. Right. Like that kind of thing. And instead it's like, no, I, it, there's a perfectly reasonable reason why I know some first aid skills and I may get stuck in a really bad situation where Ryan is, you know, critically wounded and we yeah. don't have the medic and I need to draw on something and it makes sense that I have that. Right. Mm-hmm. And you can have, so you can, it allows you to have a little bit of skills in some broad and interesting areas uh, while also being really good at the thing you're good at, which not a lot of systems can do. And yeah, I love it. It really feels like you dive deep into who these characters are uh, instead of just what they can do, which is uh, really fascinating from what I found. Right, right. And a lot of classless systems can do that. I like the way that Blue Planet does it. Yes. Well, I like the ability to kind of mix and match those things that you don't get with classes. You you say, I am a bard, I am a cleric, I am a, you know, whereas right. we all picked, there were some things that we all picked similarly, but because of other choices that we made kind of put together all of these pieces in a very different fashion well here's another thing too this idea that like okay we we drive a character party generation on let's all do different roles so that we can work together as a team which all makes sense right yeah but both you both both of the two of you picked native and university yeah Mm -hmm. so i don't know about you but i met a lot of my good friends in university. So we all had university background, right? Right. Like, so like if, but we can hang out together and have different skills and focuses and, and work together as a team, even though we all had at least one part of our background be similar. Mm -hmm. So you guys can have known each other, right. From university and have that rich, like history, but still be very different characters and still play different roles in the party, but allowed to have that. And I, there, it's really, it's not something you actually see in a lot of role-playing games. No. So I think, um, if the, you know, the question is, how does it stack up? I think, I think it's a little bit dated, uh, but (laughs) I still really like the final product. I think it does a great job of creating a person that seems uh, realistically skilled and capable and fits into the setting because of the background and training choices you make. I think where I could admit that the system sort of falls down, especially in 
relationship to more modern mechanics is that it doesn't really address the psychology of the character, mm -hmm. right? There's not much to talk about or to give mechanical context or mechanical push to issues they might be dealing with or desires and hopes they might have. I mean, there are character goals is something you choose, but there's no mechanical push to push you towards that. For example, like in gumshoe games where you can gain, you, you gain some of your advantages by actually pursuing your goal or you're penalized by not pursuing your goal when you choose mm -hmm. not to. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really include any of that in, in this uh, mechanic set. And I think that's probably the only, the, the place I would, I would point to first, if I were saying that it, where it's most dated. Yeah. And I, but in defense, sorry, Jeff, <laughs> sit down. I'm defending you against yourself so it in the era in which that, that jeff and i grew up both playing games and hacking games and that kind of stuff trust me the idea of mechanizing emotional or sociological or character interaction concepts came up a lot and the solutions were bad <laughs> like it was taking the options of what you can do with the role playing of your character it was basically saying why is the game telling me how to role play my character yeah. right that was the reaction that we had because we had not developed mechanically the game design aesthetics of being able to mechanize ways to encourage people to play a particular way without limiting what that was now we in the last 10 years we've developed all kinds of amazing and interesting ways to do it but it wasn't really a thing back then people would literally fight against a mechanic that mechanized your ability to role play back then yeah. And I th and I think that's important to note when you're looking at a game like this. And and it, honestly, you know, original versions of games like D and D, you know, people are like, oh, there's no social mechanic. Well, yeah, but you didn't grow. You didn't. You weren't playing it back then. You don't know what that was like. There was no. There was no environmental pressure to create that mechanic. Yeah. Right. It was discovered after literally decades of layering mechanic on mechanic and mechanic the and evolution of the hobby. Exactly. Exactly. And it's great. I agree with Jeff. If we were going to do a third edition, I would want to incorporate some of those mechanics, but I don't think it necessarily draws away from this character generation mechanic as much as uh, Jeff is, uh, is saying. Jeff has been incredibly hard on this, on this game for being dated and he needs to settle down. You're hard on your own children. <laughs> That's fair, but you also don't know how to edit your own stuff. Let other people tell you what it's like. <laughs> but you love your children more than other children, so yeah. that's true. It's very true, even with all their flaws. Yes, I, I mean I, that's a, a valid metaphor, though. I think like I love my children dearly, but I am very aware of <laughs> right all of their flaws because I spend much more time around them than other people. Oh, so right. I mean, maybe that is a good way to look at it. <laughs> and well, also, I'm also talking from a perspective of where the last three years I've been working feverishly on a very narrative game that approaches right. role-playing very differently and recently have been uh and, and i last week i played my first powered by the apocalypse game which considering how long it's been out it's kind of a surprise it's taken this long but um you know it's a good example of of the kind of thing we're talking about yeah, yeah i still exactly. haven't played one i've made characters for one but i still haven't actually played <laughs> a pbta game so <laughs> Has that made you, has, has writing a more narrative game made you more aware of the flaws or what you see as the flaws in this one? Or was it something yeah. that you kind of always knew and just didn't know how to adjust? No, I mean, you don't go from writing a simulationist game like Blue Planet to writing a narrative game overnight. Like I, I just started, as I got older, I was less concerned about the simulationist stuff and was more interested in just the arc of the story, the story beats, and the emotions driving the characters. And that kind of led to Upwind being like it is. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, a Studio Ghibli film is not a simulationist story. Right? <laughs> no. Um, you, want to able, you want to be able to model that sort of like fanciful <laughs> wonder, and you can't do it with a, a more grindy mechanic system. So at the time, I mean, Blue Planet did exactly what it was supposed to do. Upwind does something different. Powered by the Apocalypse does something different. I've just gotten really much more open in what I want out of games. Like everything is good. It used to be, I just wanted it to be realistic. I wanted to feel like I was there. Now I just, I'm much more open about my own design, but other people's work too. And, and just like 
the idea that there's so many possibilities in all the different sorts of mechanics. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's there's something for everyone out there. That's half of why we're doing this is just yeah. to to see what all the choices are. <laughs> well, I tell I tell people a lot like when you're critiquing something recently, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but I'm doing the whatever it is, the April tabletop role playing game daily challenge where they ask a question every day. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions which mine hasn't aired that, that hasn't come up yet, but one of the questions was uh what kind of critiques do you prefer? And I tell people this in critiquing all the time, whatever you're critiquing. You could absolutely tell somebody what doesn't work, what isn't working for you. And if you can be, you know, kind of specific about it, that's helpful. The problem is, is that everybody wants to do that. And the other thing that is incredibly helpful to people is making sure that they know what does work. Because if you only tell somebody, if you love everything, but you tell them the three things that are terrible and don't work, then they're like, okay, well, what, uh, I guess, do I change these other things too? Like... I don't know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. So if you tell someone like, man, this part sings, this part needs some tightening. Then they're like, oh, okay, good. Well, I got, I got a foundation here and that's working. Let's see what I can build off of that to go to the next place. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate, I do appreciate what Jeff's doing. There are things about this game that are 20 years old and that's perfectly fine, right? And you do need to recognize what those things don't work, but you have to recognize what does work as well. And yeah. it, even if it's just the through line or the theme of what was being attempted so that you can carry that forward into the development. And for me, this layering of origin over background over professions, I think is fantastic. I yeah. love it. I also just think that there's value in taking time to realize that not everything is for everyone all the time. Right. Um, and, you know, as someone who has always sort of preferred more narrative games, despite the fact that I have not played that many of them because that was not what my group was interested in. There's value in understanding that some people like those really crunchy games. Some people, you know, at, even at different times in your life or, you know, just when you're in a different mood, sometimes that simula simulationist thing is what you're looking for. And sometimes you just want to tell a really weird superhero story and that's okay it's I think important when you're critiquing things to take a minute and say, okay, who is this for? And is it accurately or appropriately catering to that demographic then? That's really well put. Yeah. Yeah. Really well put. So I think we accidentally answered the next few questions. Uh, so so in the interest of time, I think we'll, uh, we'll jump ahead a little bit. How balanced are the different for lack of better word classes? In this game um, absolutely not and that was a design intention um there there is no balance at all uh because it's a essentially a point by system mm -hmm. that's made some of the choices for you in the training packages and there's the different power levels uh you can have i think it even says in the text you can have a street urchin playing alongside a super soldier if that's what the game master and the party the players want to do yeah if there's a reason for that story to be told and that's why is so that you can tell any story you want i i still don't believe in game balance in the same way that i think it's a religion amongst some people role-playing games have sort of lost the gameist part of mm -hmm. or at least expanded beyond the boundaries of games gameist in ways that that you they can be perfectly satisfying and have disparity amongst the characters and uh, Blue Planet was designed with that intention on purpose, which at the time was was quite, was pretty uncommon. Yeah, and it seems like a very realistic approach too. Uh, like when you're trying to go for a very realistic setting with realistic feeling science behind it, in the real world, you've got that sort of disparity between people. You've got like soldiers in the military that are going to be way better at doing combat and survival stuff than Joe Average down on his luck, you know, from Smallsville, USA. If you put those two people together in a group, there's going to be this, this huge difference in how they handle the situations. But if there's a, if there's a narrative reason for them to be together, it really is all about how you can tie that story together and not about what can they do. Yeah, and it doesn't work for everybody, just like mm -hmm. we were, Amelia was just saying. But um, 
it is something that your group has to be okay with before you do that. Obviously, you could say, okay, everyone's going to be exceptional power level characters. And then theoretically, they have the same resources from which to build their characters. So theoretically, in as much as we are able to balance those numbers, they're going to be equally capable. But I don't think I've ever told a group of people playing Blue Planet that this is the power level you have to play. Right. And so I think it, you do want to make sure your group is on board with it. But beyond that, there's, I don't see any mechanical reason why you have to have balance. Thanks. Well, and I'm going to do what apparently is my job here and counter Jeff on a few points. Um, <laughs> because it depends on the system you're playing. So if you're looking at something like, um, say, Pathfinder or third edition D&D, where you have uh, unbounded accuracy, right? So you have a fifth level character versus a 20th level character. That disparity is going to be enormous in mm -hmm. every level of the game, right? Well, but that but that's but, sort of a little bit apples and oranges, really. Well, right? I'm not, I'm getting there. I'm getting okay. there. <laughs> right. So some of that aspect, right? Say if we just look at hit points, right? There's no hit points in Blue Planet, and part of the way the game plays, which again is quite realistic, is that if you have someone with a knife, they could kill you <laughs> with it. And just someone like with and, and someone with a giant handgun could also shoot you in the head and not kill you, right? So the way that the system is designed allows for the both of those things. A little kid that stabs you with a knife in this system could potentially put you into a critical character situation. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about a game like D&D, like &D, where a 20th level character's got you know 200 hit points and all this stuff, and a fifth level character doesn't, then that disparity of that game mechanic balance is going to show itself. It's gonna, it's gonna be real apparent. Though you, technically you're right, a person who's got a, a, who's a exceptional versus you know some other level is going to ha technically have a few more points and different skills and how they pan out. Even characters who are in this at the same power level, depending on their backgrounds and everything else, their skills will stack on top of each other so that well, I'm a combat pilot and my combat piloting skill is eight, but no one else in this party has a skill level of eight in anything because of the way that they've picked their backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Though technically we're still the same level. They just may have skills, you know, spread out. Yeah. There are ways to shine in the game that are div that are that are aside or different from. Okay, I'm a killer whale with a body of fifteen, and you're a human with a body of zero. If I hit you, it's gonna be bad. Yeah, it, it's the way it, it's the way that the mechanics work. Although I, I, you can look at them and say, yes, technically, I guess maybe they're not quite balanced, but the disparity is not as as extreme in Blue Planet when well, you're that's playing just different power in, levels. in the setting, right? In D and D, you've got this idea that eventually you become godlike. Well, right. there's, there's no godlike characters in the planet. Exactly. You just never have that range, even after lots of advancement. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the way that a game like Masks deals with disparity. If you have high, the classic example, if you have Hawkeye and Hulk in the same you know, party, how do you even have a game? Yeah. Well, if you're looking at it from D&D &D or Champions standpoint, you're right. That's going to be rough. But if you're looking at it from Masks, it's like, oh, yeah, it's perfectly, it's perfectly valid. Hawkeye could be in a wheelchair and and have like all kinds of problems. Like in in the comics, he's deaf. Like all these things that would be like quote unquote disadvantages in another system, they're not relevant because the game system doesn't focus on those things. The game system focuses on how do you feel and who are you and what do you what are you inside. And in Blue Planet, it focuses to me. The system focuses on sure. There's a lot of skills. And there's a lot of primary attributes and they kind of have this simulationist feel. But all of that to me is just like, this is just the knife to get to the cake. And the cake for me is the story and the richness of the history and what develops between that interaction with the setup that Jeff and his team created, which is civil war and politics and native versus colonialism. And, you know, this gold rush with Xenosilicate, Long John stuff and, you know, interrelationships between diff literally different species. Like that's the cake. The, the mechanics are solid. They're good. They get the job done. They do stuff that I want to see, which is I hate seeing a knife do a D4 damage on somebody who's got 200 hit points. It just bugs <laughs> me. Because I'm a nurse and I want to yeah. see, I, I would like to see the drama being not about combat. The drama in this game is like, don't get into combat. It's bad. 
right? <laughs> so if somebody is a GEO soldier and is really good at combat, that's great. You're going to need that once in a while, but please don't put me in a combat yeah. if we can possibly help it. Where D&D asks for the combat, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. I think that's a solid point, though, too, because, I mean, you think about if it is a simulationist kind of game, you know, if you quote unquote level up in real life, if you graduate from college or you've been working out at the gym or we whatever, it's still going to hurt if you get stabbed. Right. No amount of time put into crunches is going to make bleeding out not lethal. And so that is not a, a realistic thing. And right. if the goal of this game is to simulate some of that realism, right. it, that's not and, how and it should so, work. And so if we talk about how a game system, how a game mechanic should, should guide players or, or a moderator, a game master to a particular experience, whether Jeff and his team intended it or not, which only he can speak to, the game itself, when you get into combat and realize how potentially lethal it can be, you very quickly figure out that these that, that it's better to talk your way out of it mm -hmm. right so it, the game itself is guiding you toward a thing where where if a combat happens there's anxiety yeah right yeah, if you're shooting something went wrong yeah if you're shooting something went wrong how many action science fiction games do you know of that have that yeah. draw to it they don't lead you there our game best role-playing game i've played in 40 years it wasn't a single combat that's awesome. The whole thing, and I don't even know, we made a half a dozen, maybe 10 skill rolls. At the end, somebody drew a gun, but didn't decided not to use it. Yep. And awesome. that was, crit the fact that they chose not to use it was absolutely critical to the experience that ended at the end, that was the end of that game. Right. So... That's the kind of thing that I think may be happening. This is why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm countering some of Jeff's point. I'm not just a big fan of the game, but I'm a big fan of the game for a particular reason. And from a, a player's standpoint, whatever their intention was in creating the game or presenting the game in a particular way, I'm on the, I was as a player on the receiving end, and what I was getting was a very specific message, yeah. right? That may or may not have been what Jeff had intended. Jeff, was that what you intended? <laughs> Are you speaking about the system, Rich, or are you talking about the game at Gen Con? Oh, the system. Yeah. Well, I mean, in game design, for I know, I know everyone has different processes, but for me, you always have to reference back to one of whatever your main intentions are. And if your main intention is to create a simulist, simulationist sort of, of experience, then that's sort of what you're referencing. And so the decisions about where you're going to guide choices, well those are left to the players because you're trying to create touchstones that are feel real and then they can make real decisions about them. Right. So we're, mm -hmm. it wasn't that we necessarily intended that people avoid combat, but we did actually do research into trauma and, and death associated with shooting. And that's where sort of our, our, our will and trauma roles come from and why you can still get shot a couple of times and keep acting, or you can get shot once and be dead mm -hmm. um, because that's how real life works. And if your character is willing to risk that, then that's a choice your player makes. If they're not willing to risk that, then that's a choice your character makes, mm -hmm. the player makes. Right? And, and I think the gut instinct when you hear something like that as a player is like, oh, no, I don't want to create this character and just get shot once and die. Okay, well, it's not quite like that. It becomes it, – it, it is a potential for that to happen, but it's not necessarily likely – and there's plenty of spots along the way well, to stop not, yourself from getting into that situation in the first not place. In, you know, you, the session doesn't consist of kicking in doors and, and fighting what's inside. Right. 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 So that's just not it, part of the, the story that are typically told in Blue Planet. Though you can. You can play a spec ops team that kicks in doors and, and gets in fights. But then they're going to be heavily modified with lots of armor and, yep. and, cryo, right. and, 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 and cryo repair units. And, I mean, there's going to be options to keep your character alive right if amelia's character is unable to do her job or like like something bad happens or if i get us into a, like a criminal back alley somewhere and it goes it goes south i'm going to be real glad jeff's character's there to help us get out of it yeah. because of their combat skill but he might be his character might be the best combat skilled person you've ever built and they may never use those skills if we do our jobs right right does have meteorology too so you know right exactly i do too i had it's meteorology not, it's not all it's not all guns right exactly and that's again part of the advantage of the system is when you're picking these so you have 
you know, for us, we have five, six, seven, basically eight different things we're picking to as jigsaw puzzle pieces to plug mm -hmm. together and you that makes the characters in some way even though it does look like a lot of skills it also makes them broader more rich like your 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 gun specialist also has meteorology too and sailing you know or whatever and like you see them as a, as more as a more uh, fulfilled broad character well and there's nothing worse than going into a game and having a very like specific character concept and then just having that not come up at all like i built this character to do this one thing and then that just for whatever reason in play doesn't come up right and or so it's, it's nice to have those broad things and you think about in real life too like even if i i don't but if i did know how to shoot a gun that is not the only thing that i know how to do i am a well-rounded person and now. in other in other systems that are quote unquote more game balanced like this generic term game balance that we're using here if you 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 either have to specialize or you broaden and if you broaden you're usually not that good at any mm -hmm. little thing and you're and if you don't specialize you're doing it quote unquote wrong and that bothers me and in blue planet that just doesn't come up Right. as much in other games and i i appreciate the system for that it sounds like we answered pretty much the rest of our questions throughout this conversation as well uh, aside from a few very specific questions that should give us enough time to jump into our character advancement section where we discuss uh character advancement in the system and uh why don't we go and do that and take it up a level take it up a level Take it up a level. So character advancement is actually not nearly as big a part of the game as it is with something like Dungeons and Dragons, which yeah. character advancement, I think, is sort of one of the, the hearts of D&D, &D. I mean, especially in all the, the user research they did as they developed new additions. That was sort of a central element that they wanted to emphasize and, and always keep. In Blue Planet, it's very incremental. It's a couple of character improvement points at a time so that the idea being if you do a thing in the game, there's a chance that you got better at that thing. You earn some points based on what some guidelines we offer, but even those are pretty simplistic. And then you can use those to advance things that either you used or that you can justify having worked on in your downtime. Nothing elaborate. I think the rules for advancement are less than a page. And, and so without levels, there's no major power jumps. Um, and the only way to sort of dramatically increase your capacity in a short period of time is to get a biomod of some kind okay, um, and, and gain sort of additional powers or abilities through that. Yeah. And it's, it's a real straightforward system. You know, basically you get a certain number of character points at the end of a game and they're usually like, you know, two to six or seven something like that maybe and then if you want to increase a skill do you spend the amount of uh what he called character improvement points or chips which i thought was really clever oh okay way. you spend those so my character's got an aquatic skill of six so if i wanted to get to seven then you have to spend like the points of the level i think it's the level that you're going to or the level that you had i can't yeah, remember it's a progressive that. scale so that you can't Right. Get the ridiculously high skills without really investing a lot of resources. Right. Right. It's very similar to the way that Fantasy Flight's uh, Edge of the Empire does it as well. Mm -hmm. Like you, you can increase things, but you have to, you know, spend a certain number of points based on whatever the previous skill level was, kind of thing. And so, okay. um, and there are other systems that do that as well. But again, that really, you know, I'll take your aquatic six to an aquatic seven. So mm -hmm. it, it ups it by 10% which is nice, but it takes a while to get there. And again, it tightens things up. It's this thing that D&D &D did with its newest edition with this bounded accuracy to let's, let's tighten the disparity up a bit. And so uh, again, plays back into what we were talking about, about the game balance aspect where these are uh, tightened up, you know, and you okay. can also spend a few points here and there on your lower level skills to take a two to a three or a three to a four pretty easily. So that you, again, those things that you have some training in, you can feel, like you're getting, you really do feel like a, a, a three to a four, you know, a 10% from a 30% to a 40% feels like a pretty healthy jump. Yeah. Right. Where an 80 to a 90%, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, I can stick with the 80. 80 is solid. Really? I don't need to go to a 90, you know, that right. kind of thing. So you get to that depth and breadth again with the system. Yeah. And I know when I was going over a character creation uh, at the start, there's that little chart that says, you know, these are the numbers for these various categories for the everyday, for the exceptional, and for the elite. And I noticed that every day the max level, quote unquote, was four. 
max level for exceptional was six and elite was eight. And that's as you, that's as you buy the character points initially. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just at the beginning of the game. So you can go oh, above okay. that. You can go above that with the character points that you, that you get through adventuring. It just, when you initially create your character, uh, okay. and you with that and and one of the nice, fun examples that I that I mentioned earlier, I think before we were on the air, that Jeff brought in was that you can mix and match those. So you could have you know like exceptional or elite level skilled people while keeping the characteristic maximum of you know your you know your your common everyday person and be playing for example a bunch of like uh, retired adventurers or retired explorers mm -hmm. or retired soldiers who maybe their ability scars aren't quite what they used to be but their skills are really good yeah and so you can kind of mix and match that to create some things that some other systems don't do very well like you, it's hard to play the grizzled old fighter who's level 15 but has some achy bones and isn't quite as good as they used to be. Yeah. It's hard to do that in, in, in say a D&D &D or a level based system, but here you can do that pretty easily. And I think that would be a fascinating game concept. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's I, have a, cool. I have a philosophy about sort of the whole game balance and, and level uh, or not level characteristics and the idea of game versus storytelling, because we, we pretend we assume that the game master is infallible and that every penalty or bonus that they suggest during play is somehow calculated by a, a perfect calculus. And so there is a game with rules like a board game that isn't being violated. But it is so easy for game masters to make mistakes. It is so easy for even things as sophisticated as the CR rating to be misbalanced right. against a character party. And ultimately, the whole game or the argument that it's not balanced or it's not fair or whatever goes out the window when you truly assess the impact that a game master can have positively or negatively on all of the numbers in a game simply by virtue of them having to deal with a thousand variables as they tell mm -hmm. this story. So I, I think just accepting that games are inherent, role-playing games are inherently not games in that regard and not therefore perfectly bounded or perfectly adjudicated, I think right. makes it just a lot easier to frame the discussions like this. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think it even it, even aside from mechanics, um, uh, again, because D and D is the most people know something about it. Like it's even just choices. So back in the day, when there was a problem with the idea that rangers have this favorite enemy, well, that's great. You're really good against this favorite enemy. But if the if the DM never puts that creature into your game ever. <laughs> then suddenly you're definitely not balanced versus the other players yeah. because you have a whole mechanic that's not being used. Or if you're great in a particular terrain or that kind of stuff, this DM fiat thing, which is a challenge. So it, it, it I, I totally back Jeff's uh, input on like, you know, adding a bonus or giving advantage or whatever it happens to be. But it's also just in the choices that a DM can make. Sometimes we make mistakes and we realize we're not giving somebody the spotlight or, or, or allowing them to play that character. Like well, some GMs want to mistakes. play. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely not me. And um, yeah. Well, and sometimes, you know, those are the kinds of things that you even occasionally don't realize until later, too. You get halfway through a campaign and you say, holy cow, we've been really focusing on this one thing. And, you know, right. time to sort of shift the focus and move away from that, too. Right. But I mean, that's one of the reasons why we play games. I mean, I, I had a great time playing fourth edition D&D. But fourth edition D&D swung the other direction. It was so game balanced that you could not do anything improv or it broke the system. And uh, we had a great time with it, but it was a board game. And there, there's a reason why you play role-playing games versus board games. And the yes. reason is freedom or role-playing games versus video game, because there's a particular type of freedom that you can utilize with that. So I definitely, I back, I back Jeff on this, this theory. So I think that pretty much wraps up a good discussion portion of the episode. So, any last words? Yeah, any last words, you guys? <laughs> well, I'm sitting here looking at the Open Blue Planet book, and we didn't mention um, there's a, a little throwaway sidebar that's always been one of my favorite parts of character generation. Are you talking about 20 questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love I how it's so just in there. happy to see that. You know, we talk. I talk about it being dated, but at the time, that was kind of progressive. Huge. Uh, it gets at some of the things that other games have now incorporated into their mechanics here. It's just, well, you can do these if you want to yeah, um, with no mechanical consequences. But I think for people who do want more 
more out of their characters, but don't know how to do it themselves. This kind of thing, at least in Blue Planet, is valuable. Definitely. There were a lot of things that Blue Planet did, aside from mechanics and aside from how many skills and blah, 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 that I think natural selection, the supplement that's their quote unquote monster manual, is what every monster manual should have ever been and should ever be. <laughs> it's a balance between telling you about the world that the characters live in, about survival, about ecology. It tells you about so much about the it, what these beings, these these animals and these creatures are doing in the world and not just, okay, here's a thing you can run to on a random encounter table, right? It's about it's about the thing. Yes, there's mechanics to use because you need mechanics. It's a game. I mean, you do. That's fair. But it's more about like, what is this? They're talking about microscopic organisms. They're talking about like innocuous plants. These aren't plants that are just trying to kill you. They have yeah. those. But like, it's just, what is this thing? Like, how is, there's literally a shrimp in there, a shrimp analog, and it's got a recipe for like how <laughs> you would probably eat this at a restaurant. You it's know what I mean? A real, it's actually a real recipe. For sure. Right, right. So, <laughs> so you, this, this book, and, and, and when you're talking about things like 20 questions, in addition to the setting being brilliant and all the stuff we're talking about and the, and the challenges and the upsides to the mechanics, the way the books are written and how they're presented, this oceanography for gamers, here's what you need to know, here's what you need to worry about, here's what you can hand wave and don't worry about. All of this stuff, I wish more and more games would use what, what Jeff and his team's layout and presentation did for this game in, in every other game I've seen. And it yeah. goes for everything. Fluid mechanics, which is their technology thing. Frontier, uh, where is it? It's right in front of me. Uh, Frontier, Frontier, Justice. Frontier Justice. Thank you. I was thinking Frontier Law, and I was like, that's not right. Uh, Frontier Justice, which literally talks about all of this stuff that we're talking about, about legal battles and about politics, and do you want to run crime dramas and all this kind of stuff. It's just, it's just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll stand well, by it. I, Rich, I do you like this game? No, Rich likes. Rich, when Rich likes something, everybody knows it. <laughs> true. He can't. He can't hide it. No. One one know. thing I'm surprised that didn't come up during a discussion, and maybe not because it's not directly relevant to character creation, but it's a huge element of the setting, which could inform your choices about your party and what you want your story to be. Is that we didn't mention the Aborigines at all? Yeah, um, I was trying not to spoil that, but yeah. Yeah. Well, but they exist, and it's you know. They're part of the common knowledge of the characters, but they're also part of this 90s era meta story that when the colonists discover not long after their arrival that there's another probably sentient species ah. um, on the planet, but it, it's alien enough that they're not sure. And only now, um, as there's a directed effort, are they beginning to believe that, yeah, probably is. Um, and then that ties into sort of all the... It, it it ties into where the xenosilicate comes from, why it acts the way that it does is maybe not by chance or evolution. Our game at Gen Con had to do with the aboriginals um, directly uh, making some choices having to do with a particular human on this station that was missing that we didn't realize. We thought it was a political thing, and then it turns out to be this kind of existential yeah. deep thought process of whether this person is in a better place now or not. Yeah. Like... They're an intentional MacGuffin for the for game masters, but for people making characters, it may be that that's, you know, they want to be scientists of pursuing this or bounty hunters that want yeah. the claim or money or, or whatever. Or, uh, or conspiracy theorists trying to figure yeah. out what this is, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, see, and like, I, I'm not a science person necessarily. Like some of the biology part of it doesn't, appeal to me as much but like some of that like the consequences of colonialism and you know like all that kind of stuff as a mm -hmm. as a politics and history nerd i'm like i want to play that game i want to like dig deeper into that oh mm -hmm. well one of the see, see what i mean oh, the project Rich, what have you done <laughs> the project that um so we set up throughout the books this kind of growing insurgency in a particular region mm -hmm. uh, and if we do transition to a third edition, one of the books that we never got to do was sort of the the insurgency, the war that leads to an independent Poseidon. And that would be a campaign book, but also a source book for that transition to like a third edition. And I've been slowly sort of building that campaign and um, just need to find a, 
group of people that want to play through it because that would have to happen first before we could really do that that third edition that's awesome mm. yeah i have no interest in playing in that game don't even <laughs> don't even look <laughs> No, I mean, that's because like, that's a sort of area that, that really grabs my interest. And I think it, it goes back to what we talked about before, that you can play kind of anything in this right. setting. And there's ups and downsides to having that freedom, right? The paralysis through analysis we were talking about with character generation right. as well can, can apply to a setting. But for me, this setting gives you enough kind of bumpers in the, uh, in the bowling alley to be able to head you in the direction of the game that you want to play. Definitely. I think the answer is that you just have to play more games of it. That might be, mm -hmm. you know, just so that you get a chance to try out all the options well, and then know what you like. Certainly room for any kind of game you want. And that's not always true of, of most settings. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us to talk about Blue Planet and the character creation. Uh, Rich, can you go ahead and remind everyone where they can find you and what sort of things you're working on? Yeah, for sure. You can find me on Twitter mostly at uh, the Twitter account for Descent Into Midnight. That's at D-I-M-R-P-G. You can also find me at the YJ files for Whelmed, the Young Justice files. Both of those have links to my personal Twitter account, which is at Umbral Walker, U-M-B-R-A-L-W-A-L-K-E-R. -L -L uh, I'm also on Facebook. You're welcome to message me there. And really just either one of those social media sites are the best way to go. Uh, yeah, you can find uh, my latest project, Upwind, on our website. Should be hitting shelves soon. Uh, that's biohazardgames.us and you can reach me at uh, email at jdbarber at gmail.com and you can follow me at twitter at biohazardjeff wonderful thank you both again so much for sitting down and agreeing to do this with us oh my pleasure absolutely you Definitely. bet thanks jeff sorry to argue with you so much jeff <laughs> not at all <laughs> oh so much fun thank you yes. all right and and thank you everybody for tuning in we'll see you next time Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even find some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Amelia Antrim, and I can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Our other host, Ryan Bolter, can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast it originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Amelia Antrim. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also check our notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, like dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Let me do a quick test, though. Just um, test, test, test. Jeff Barber's my hero. Test, test, test. Oh, <laughs> you're my hero. Wonder Twins. <laughs> I just want to point out that I have continued my effort to wear related clothing every time we record, and that this shirt has tiny crabs on it. Oh, that's oh, awesome. Nice. So. It's going to start to become a, uh, uh, something you have to do then. Yes. I've managed, I think, every every one of them except maybe Starcrossed, I think, was the only one that I didn't. But how do you prep for that? Any shirt is fine for Starcross because exactly. you can play as normal people. Exactly. Yeah. Speaking of which, I'm going to get really warm in about an hour, so I'm going to take off my exterior shirt. Don't worry. I've got something underneath. Oh, so we uh -huh. get a show, a show along Woo! with that. Show. <laughs> This is just talk about geeky shirts reminded me I have one underneath, so. 
Ah. All set over there, Rich? Yeah, sorry. I keep trying to run the show. Yeah. Um, um, it's just it's just reflex. Sorry. If you want to, that's fine. No. I'm you know. Don't, don't let me take over. I've took on taking over too many shows. Okay. No, that's what we do. That's why we have other people here. We're like, please, please explain it to us. Yeah, run our show for us. Hello, team. Welcome to Creation Cast. <laughs> Beautiful. We yeah. have it all scripted. If you'd like, you yep. can just read the script for us. No, you I pretend don't. your name is no. Amelia. No, I don't have to read them this time. <laughs> <laughs> or write them which is really nice exactly but rich also knows not scary facts too because sometimes you can call him from the grocery store and say my kids want to know why the lobsters in the corner of the tank are in a pile and right. he says huh he says no huh. and then i make up some answer and <laughs> it sounded smart it's fine they're not, to, they're not supposed to be in a tank <laughs> yeah first right. of all right yeah exactly that was the thing it's like there's nothing in the tank and they yeah. they typically live trying to hide in rocks so they're probably just <laughs> just hiding under each other i think the answer is they need to be eaten <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's <scary. laughs> getting some psychological insight into amelia right now yes yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> learning I, about my parenting style which is those lobsters are for eating children don't worry about it <laughs> there's a very important comma in that statement oh yes yeah very important comma, <laughs> comma. okay <laughs> Rich is so excited about this. Like, I'm so excited. So, is that a, a setup question? <laughs> no. Nope. Okay. Brian will ask the actual question. Uh, the right. actual question is incoming. Incoming. All right. Hold on. I had a thing. Yeah. Cut out me thinking about the thing. <laughs> um. Never mind. I lost the thing. <laughs> Look, I have a cell phone. I have some super glue. <laughs> Good okay. to go. It's basically the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was a high school teacher. Um, might as well have all the phones super glued to the kids' hands already. Because... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, and uh, Amelia's uh, head. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, I own it. Nope, yeah. nope, nope, nope. Oh, I'm sure you do. No, I just... Oh, GURPS. <laughs> Well, are... We may cover it at some point. Oh, do we have to? We may cover there, it at some point. Anytime somebody says run it in GURPS, there are at least three other systems that are better for running that game. Let's not, let's not destroy my childhood. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Anyway, okay, I started of, playing role playing games with in the back in the day D20 too. Modern. So. Mine, was, mine was Hero System, but it basically was the predecessor to GURPS. So there you go. Um, <gasps> Ryan, I found a Palladium book in my house. Actually, it was in my car today. What? Apparently, Dan left a bunch of like RPG books in the trunk of my car. Oh. Um, and I don't know if he knows that they're there. But yeah, one of them was Palladium, and I was going to text you a picture earlier, oh, because cool. I was like, oh, look what I found in the trunk of my car. Yeah, it is, if we did a, a third volume, I said we. Did you notice that? Yeah. Well, did a, if, if we did it any other way? <laughs> I don't, but I'm obsessed. So We're going to edit the show opener now um, to say, Rich Howard, you may know him from Blue Planet version 3. <laughs> <laughs> Stop making my dreams come true. I'll tell you what, Rich. I won't. I, re I refuse to do a third edition unless you're involved. How's that? <laughs> okay. I got to oh, hold on. I got to recover. <laughs> <laughs> we, we broke Rich Howard, everybody. Oh, no. <laughs> He's only one, one seventh of the way to his t shirt. <laughs> I can't talk. Give him a little verklempt. Very clamped. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I said, you're going to have to recover because you're only one seventh of the way to your t-shirt. Oh, that's right. I got seven more to go. Uh, <laughs> All right. Oh, that's hey, amazing. I love you, Jeff. All right. Off we go. Okay. So now you've said, I love you to your wife and to Jeff and Ryan and I are feeling really left out. I said, I love all of you guys. <laughs> <It's> just kidding. <laughs> Don't make me go on social media. I, think I it's won't embarrass you. That's right. Okay. All right. Enough of... Okay. Let's get back on track. Okay. Derailing me, Jeff. 
<laughs> Jeez, Jeff. I know. I'm terrible. <laughs> what a jerk. I'm a monster. Uh-huh. You're a monster. <laughs> Where are we at? I don't Game even know face. where we're at. I'm not looking at an outline, so I have no it's idea up. where we are. All right. I mean, edit us, edit, edit the crap out of us, please. Oh, yeah. I'll just put it all at the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you do whatever you need, man. <laughs> and then what uh, What role were you going to be in this, like, rescue team? You said you were, like, na- expert dancer in what else? Um, diplomacy. Oh, you're our face. Yeah. <laughs> That's not surprising. I know. I was trying really hard to pick something different this time, and I can't do it. But now I really want a sandwich because you're eating a sandwich. And apparently three hours ago, Amelia was talking about peanut butter sandwiches on Twitter. I have no other food in my house because I refuse to go grocery shopping. (laughs) (sighs) I have to do it. I have to suck it up and do it, and I don't want to. Just do it. I, I never I never had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. That was one of my conditions when I got married. I said, I will do all of the laundry forever, but I will not go grocery shopping. I will not really? do it. I, I hate it. I hate it. That's so it, interesting. It might have changed now, though. I, I've been to a grocery store since then. I've had to pick up, like, one or two things, but I've not had you to, like... You didn't just buy six of those lobsters? That's, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> they were very cute lobsters. <laughs> they offered, they were like, do you want, they offered to take one out of the tank. They're like, do you want to see it? And I was like, no, we don't want to be friends with it. Like, no. No. <laughs> I was like, do you want us to name it, too? <laughs> Rich Howard. Now we um we pick our um well, I was like gonna sound really intelligent and then I <laughs> totally lost my <laughs> gosh. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like Talking Tabletop. Talking Tabletop is an interview-style podcast created for tabletop gamers. Jim McClure talks with industry leaders to find out what makes them tick. The goal is to celebrate this incredible community of people and offer an avenue for collaboration between themselves, this community, and those pushing tabletop innovation.